Okay, we are live. It is Wednesday, August 31st, and I'm in Frisco, Texas, uh, the Sentient Energy headquarters for North America, Sentient Energy owned by the Cook Brothers. They have an amazing set of products that help the grid become smarter than smart. And uh, they're going to be uh, their sponsors uh, of the event. And you can see their logo there over my um, right shoulder. Um, and uh, they're going to be there next week. And we're looking forward to having them. We have a great guest today. Um, uh, but before we get rolling, let's ask our own Dr. John Sibley Butler for some music. Well, I know it's kind of late. I hope I didn't wake you. But what I've got to say can't wait. I know you'd understand. Every time I tried to tell you, the words just came out wrong. So I'll have to say I love you in a song. Very nice, very nice, nice intro. John Butler, how are you, sir? I understand that you are enjoying being emeritus. I am. This is my first day as an emeritus professor. I actually love it. I'm working hard, still writing my books, but I'm doing good and I'm looking at the world. And now I can just be John Sibley Butler as Michael Porter is Michael Porter, <laughs> my dear friend. But the world is pretty interesting now. We're going through lots of stuff uh, in America. And let's just make the economy a constant, okay? A constant in the sense that it is very, very variable. And around the economy is the issue of the former president. Around uh, the economy is the issue of the ballot, the war that's in Europe. Around the economy is, is the issue of Texas and, and, and sending immigrants to other parts of the world. And of course, standing between it all is, is still the virus and how we think about the virus. But the biggest change, the biggest change is the expectations of workers and the workplace. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of people working in different places, we are living in a different world. The National Science Foundation has come up with a, with a proposal, which I'm a part of, to, to look, at, uh, look at what happens when all of these things happen. Do we just continue to just hire people with no organizational structure? Everybody then becomes a free agent. Does organization structure means well? So we got everything involved, but at the core of our market economy is what will our enterprises look like in the future? Where will people mm -hmm. work in the future? And is it easier to me if we're gonna do the, the diversification of work, then can I hire somebody from another country who can come online? So it's, it's pretty interesting what's going on there. Lots of research topics to, to go over. Absolutely, absolutely well said. Llewellyn King, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, Andre. Good to see you. Good to be on the program. And I actually totally concur with what Johnny has just said. And you might note that as down as being fairly exceptional. He probably thinks it's a trick, uh, but I do concur with him that if you can hire somebody remotely, why should they be in this country at all? And why should they be subject to the um, pay regime of this country, which opens a whole new idea? We lost a lot of manufacturing because uh, of low wages overseas. Are we now going to lose a lot of our brain employment because of low wage brains overseas? It is an interesting thought. But in the interim, we are heading into one of the most dangerous and difficult winters the world has ever seen. Not just ourselves, the world. We're on several paths that uh, uh, really do not go to the same place. First off, Europe is in a parlous shape for, for this winter, and the whole northern hemisphere is going to be cold. There's a lack of energy. There's an energy shortage, uh, which has been caused largely by European willful dependence on natural um, gas and other petroleum products from Russia, now subject to sanctions and also subject to reduced flows or 
er and erratic flows from Russia. Um, I just made a television program yesterday about it, and it's quite frightening. But I think the larger issue is going to be inflation in food pricing, that a lot of people are going to be able not only not to buy heating, they're not going to have enough to eat. And that does not, that is not confined by any means to the Northern Hemisphere. The whole of Africa is at stake, the whole of the Middle East. They have depended on grain shipments from Russia and Ukraine. Those are now cut off. It is not clear that there'll be anything for them to eat at any price. And if the price is high, they have no money with which to pay for it. I fear that you will see famine in Africa and famine in large swaths of the Middle East, the under oiled parts of the Middle East. Uh, it's a very, very difficult time and we will not be immune. We will not sit in an island of relative wealth, relative warmth and relative good food. We will pay the price in inflation, instability and uh, a very uncertain future for this winter and possibly extending through next year. It is a very difficult time. We can't deal with some of the issues that Johnny raised until we get through this winter. It's going to totally command our attention and we're going to have a very difficult time. Unfortunately, the public has not concentrated on this because we have such a social issues division at home that we're not looking at the big picture. We're looking at all these, really in the great scheme of things, trivial culture war issues. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Well, you know, the, the, the world is really moving fast. Uh, we are, you know, heading into the fall semester. Uh, we have a great guest that will help us um, shed some light on what's going on, but let me say hello to him first and then and I'll introduce him to all of you who just tuned in. Let me say hi to Ken Wax. Ken, how are you, sir? Hello, Andres. Thank you very much for inviting me to your great uh, collection of uh, speakers, moderators, fascinating people. Absolutely. Glad to have you. We're looking forward to spending an hour with you. For those of you that don't know Ken, uh, I happen to have known him now for a long time. Uh, he is truly a superstar and has been contributing to society for a long time. He is a management and engineering consultant focused on many things, including smart home and smart building systems. Uh, he uh, is, uh, you know, uh, someone who uh, has, you know, a tremendous uh, respect in the industry. He has been, you know, a pioneer in establishing uh, systems and standards uh, a worldwide and multiple organizations. Uh, he was uh, appointed by the United States Department of Energy to serve four terms at the Grid Wise Architecture Council, focusing on the grid interface to customer equipment, including the uh, distributed energy resources, uh, things like local power for wind, solar, and storage, and smart appliances, and things like that. Also, uh, you know, managing thing, you know, uh, manage, uh, you know, automatically with artificial intelligence and where the future is going to go with the Jetsons and all that. He is a founding member of the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel. I happen to have been on the board of that as well, uh, and he uh, had sits on the uh, Smart Electric Power Alliance uh, Customer Grid Edge Committee. Uh, start trying to solve all those issues uh, related to Interstate Renewable Energy Council matters uh, at SEPA. He is a member of ISO and IEC and have been elected chair of the Committee Development International Home and Building System Standards for nine terms. Um, and he received the IEC 1906 award commemorating the founding of the IEC uh, and honoring experts whose work is fundamental to world standards. He has also written um, American national standards in home automation and network appliances for the Customer Technology Association. 
where he chairs the Energy Management Standards Committee. He's featured contributor to the CABA Journal or the Continental uh, Automated Building Association. Um, uh, and and uh, he's also written numerous uh, uh, articles, over 300 papers and presentations. He wrote the book, Home Automation and Utility Customer Services. And as an entrepreneur at a venture-backed startup, he developed Unix workstations for the semiconductor industry in his early days. He received a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT as a Hertz fellow in study at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Welcome, Ken. Thanks, Andres. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Johnny, unfortunately, we don't have a, a Longhorn a PhD today, but an MIT guy will do. Are you okay with that? I love MIT. I think they have set the standards there. Richland Institute is, is the reason why we're there. I have spoken there many times, and I can tell you this. You go into the bathroom, and the inventor of everything in the bathroom, the name is on the bathroom. It's on the commode. It's, on, it's, on, it's everywhere. <laughs> I love MIT. They're a great school. It's been a great school for a long, long time. Yeah. Ken, Ken you, you travel to Europe back and forth. You, you know, I, I'm curious real quick from your point of view, we ask every guest for his questions are usually around the impact of COVID, the disruption of COVID, perhaps the benefits of COVID. Uh, we tend to think that COVID has been an ally of digital transformation an accelerator in many ways, the pandemic in general and where things are going. What's your take on COVID and has it been a plus or a minus? Uh, obviously, the, you know, not, not ignoring the, the human toll or of a million plus Americans and millions more worldwide, which are, we're very sorry. And, and I do have some family members that unfortunately have passed, but what's your, what are your thoughts on COVID as it relates to digital transformation in, in, in helping or, or deterring your job? Well, it has had a pro profound effect, especially in the work I do on international standards. Uh, the standards we developed for ISO and IEC, that's uh, the International Organization for Standardization and the International Electrotechnical Commission. These two uh, international bodies have just about every planet on the and every country on the planet is a member of one or the other or both. Uh, there are uh, voluntary standards promote, to promote international trade and commerce. ISO and IEC collaborate on IT standards. So things that we use every day, like streaming video, MP3, MPEG, for, uh, we're all uh, standardized by ISO and IEC. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, depend upon invitations from the member nations to meet twice a year uh, and sit around a big conference table. And I consider it like the United Nations of Engineers, where we thrash out differences. And many of the differences are political, not just engineering. But uh, fortunately, most of us are engineers and we... Uh, like to think that science eventually wins out and irrational statements will eventually lose. Uh, nevertheless, politics is important. Since the pandemic, we have not been able to meet face to face. In fact, our upcoming meeting in a few weeks next month will continue to be virtual because we had been planning to meet on a university campus uh, in Germany. And uh, they withdrew their invitation because they just don't want a bunch of foreigners roaming around their campus carrying who knows what. So uh, we've been meeting virtually since the spring of 2020. Ironically, we've had greater participation than we had face to face. We, mm. I, I arranged the meetings. I am, uh, I, I'm responsible for calling the meetings. So instead of doing them in huge blocks of time, we used to meet uh, four or five days a week, nine to five every day. Instead, we meet two to three hours a day over a period of a couple of weeks via Zoom. And uh, we keep people's attention and we make, we're making good progress. The only downside 
is the fact the world is round and yeah. time zones screw things up. So our compromise is to have half our meetings beginning at 10 a.m. East Coast time and half our meetings beginning 11 p.m. East Coast time. So sometimes the Asians are grumbling and sometimes the Americans are grumbling. Say la vie, that's it. Yeah, but yeah, no. no the that's bottom line is we're making progress and our responsible areas are home and building automation and applications, foremost of which is energy management. Right. So, okay. so Ken, real quick, uh, give us a synopsis of where, where the world is at. You have been doing this for 30 plus years. So have I. Uh, home automation has been around for a long time, building automation, cybersecurity, you know, water, energy efficiency. Where are we? Where are we as a society? I mean, are we, are we, you know, are, are we, are we getting closer to the Jetsons? I mean, what does it look like 10 years out, 20 years out? What do you think? Well, I'll, I'm trying to be optimistic, and I think we've been making quite a bit of progress. When I started in this industry in the mid-80s, uh, the only home automation was a product called X10, which allowed you to turn off lamps in another room remotely. And it was primarily viewed as a hobbyist product. The gadgets were sold in uh, Radio Shack, for example. Uh, what started to transform in the mid 80s and the reason I got involved is because I was invited to uh, head the engineering part of a project by the uh, National Association of Home Builders, which is one of the largest trade and lobby groups in the United States. I got quite an education on what really goes on in Washington, D.C. and how our national policies get set. They get set by arm twisting. And uh, lobbyists are the ones who do the arm twisting. And I was there being paid by an association who really knew how to uh, lobby. And the, when we go to fill out our income tax and get to deduct our mortgage and real estate tax, that's because of the lobbying done by National Association of Home Builders. So they decided that it would help their builders, which included almost all the builders of single family and small commercial buildings, and it would help them to organize all the infrastructure in a building, all the wiring for telecommunications and doorbells and HVAC and all the other things. It's about a dozen systems that go into a new house. The problem is practical. The tradespeople are tripping over each other mm -hmm. because they have to schedule two to three visits to the site to uh, assess where to put in their cabling, to install their cabling, to connect their cabling, to test their cabling. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as they were looking to integrate the cabling, they came to me through a set of connections uh, to say, could we add additional cabling for home automation? Frankly, we don't know what it is other than watching the Jetsons, but you'll help us figure it out. Mm -hmm. So home automation has been evolving kind of gradually, but it's becoming quite pervasive now uh, so that uh, the, the networks we have in our house, be it Ethernet or Wi-Fi, are the infrastructure that enables home automation. So the world of the Jetsons is slowly emerging. It's not a curtain raiser where we, it suddenly happens and we applaud. It's something that every year there's a little bit more and the prices keep falling. And what was a hobbyist industry is now a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I, I want to ask you a rather simple question. Is there an optimum size of building for the environment? Is it the single family home? Is it a multi-story apartment building? Is it the small apartment building? Uh, what is the optimum size? I've been uh, studying the problems of very large buildings in expelling heat, etc. cetera. Um, what environmentally is the superior building? Well, I can only tell you based on what I've seen evolving in the industry and the talk at the in the builder community has been cluster housing, uh, which would fill your uh, definition of a small size apartment building, whether it's attached townhouses 
uh, either in a row that you find in cities that where row houses began in the 18th century in England and spread to the U.S. cities, or whether it's clusters of, uh, uh, say, a quadplex for houses grouped together. A lot has to do with the availability of land and how scarce land is. And of course, that's what led to the high rises. But high rises had their own problems creating uh, a micro environment that's not always the most healthy. Of course, there are also externalities that we tend not to look at uh, with single family and cluster homes, like transportation. And if we're burning oil in our cars, that's a fairly large environmental uh, negative. When I uh, when I first bought my house and I was speaking with a neighbor who had a much older house across the street, uh, I was at, the, at that point, the local utility was offering subsidized insulation. And I asked him, did he have insulation in his walls? He said, hell, my walls. He said, my house was built at a time when oil was a dollar a barrel, let alone a gallon. And he said, we didn't put insulation in, we burned more oil. That's interesting. I lived in a house built of stone in 1780 in Virginia. We lived there for 30 years. And of course, we had 36 inches of stone and nowhere to put insulation. When we re-roofed, we found there had been a sort of attempt at insulation with newspapers around 1912. Um, uh, and uh, it did tend to be a tandoori oven in summer and a, an ice box in winter. And of course, it wasn't very environmentally friendly because it had five working fireplaces and you use the fireplaces to very difficult to put heat in. Anyway, well, but a wonderful home nonetheless. Um, what's the future? What is well, the, the future? The good news is that uh, beginning, I would say, in the 1990s, we have been building much tighter houses in the U.S. First of all, we have the, the advantage of a plentiful wood. So we have a lot of wood frame construction, which gives us a lot of hollow spaces in the building where we can put in synthetic insulation, uh, glass-based insulation, or even newspapers, except there's it's shredded cellulose, not just crunched up and stuffed in the gap. Wonderful for historians, the old way. Right. <laughs> but the, the good news is houses are becoming very tight, in fact, so tight that they need heat exchangers to keep a constant uh, flow of air. Now, what a heat exchanger does is it captures the heat of the building before it's thrown out. Very good for northern climate buildings. Very good. Thank you. Well, Ken, Ken, let me take you from the home to the power station, to the grid edge and the technology and the overlap. It seems to me you have a number of things going on in this industry. The first, of course, we know there's a lot of technologies having to do with the home. And I want to know that I just bought a generator for my house. My brother, who is from Southern Louisiana, said everybody has one there. But it seems to me that when we when we move from the home to the to the uh, <clears throat> to the power station and the grid edge, it seems like to me that the grid the grid edge is not keeping up with the dynamics of what's happening in the home. And it also it seems like to me that the automation of the grid is not keeping up with automation, period, in America. So my question is this, as the homes themselves and buildings themselves become automated, all of that great technology where I can walk in my door and clap my hands and and, and, <laughs> and everything comes on, or the great commercials which show that you can- Every Christmas we get the ads for the clapper. That's right. My question is this, as what what is the amount of energy required and what's the relationship between moving the electricity uh, to the grid edge uh, from the power station to the grid age and then back to the home. Do you see any complications with all of the new technology and our ability to maintain the electric grid both in the home and also at the uh, the electric grid in general? Well, let me bring up, uh, the, 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 latch on to uh, something you implied, namely this dichotomy from what can be done in the house versus what can be done in traditional central power generation. And what you're alluding to is what's fundamentally a clash between the consumer electronics industry and the utility power industry. 
the power industry, before I say anything that can be construed as negative, is the su success story of the 20th century. The electric power system is the largest machine we've ever built on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's worked incredibly well in delivering everything people need and, and keeping in reserve more than people need, ready to deliver whatever you want. Two fundamental things have been occurring gradually since the 1980s and 90s is number one, a technology for generating power through other means has started to evolve and has become more and more cost effective. And secondly, we've developed an environmental consciousness that has said, wait a moment, this central power generator is actually a source of air pollution, number one. And number two, the transmission lines, which are the wires on the steel towers, are unsightly and they're messing up our countryside. Now, that's a different view from the 20s and 30s, where we viewed the, the steel towers as a sign of progress. Now we view them as uh, uh, maybe overbuilt. And because, in fact, what's happening is our population has passed 7 billion on the planet, and we haven't grown the planet. And until we start populating Mars, we got to live with what we have here. <laughs> let me let can me. i can i i like uh, that comment you can you i like that comment that is that that put mathis statement in a whole historic another light <laughs> i i i must say i like what ken just said and i i think it's quite correct i think what's going to start happening is we're going to start not rebuilding the grid it's too large a job it is the largest machine ever constructed it does work very well despite some problems, some outdating along the way. But we're going to start, rather than rebuilding it, buttressing it. We're not going to build a lot of east-west transmission lines, although prima facie they seem to be desirable. But we are going to build shorter transmission lines to strengthen parts of it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see more generation close to the point of use, especially solar generation, which to my mind is superior to wind because it's more dependable you know when the sun shines and you do not know when the wind blows witness text well, it spring. depends where you cite your uh, wind uh, turbines even it... so the brits thought that the north sea was the windiest place they could dream of and last fall there was no wind in the north sea mm. which contributed to part of the problem they have today they're woefully short of power it's exacerbated enormously by not getting supplies of gas from Russia, but it followed on from a wind route in the North Sea, which had never happened. So you really got to be very careful of depending on the wind, whereas I think you can depend on the sun. But anyway, um, you know, I, I take your point. And I, I agree with you totally. And actually what kickstarted the solar industry was, first of all, a number of countries and states had started to incentivize uh, the deployment of local solar panels. But what really drove the industry, unfortunately, was Fukushima. The uh, disaster in uh, yeah, Japan yeah, yeah, led yeah, the I'm Japanese government to uh, insist they had to diversify away from nuclear plants. So the Chinese stepped up to the plate and drove the price of solar down. Unfortunately, they drove out of business a lot of solar panel startups in the U.S. But that was back in 2012, and things are stabilizing now. And the cost of solar equipment, panels, and inverters continues to fall. So the utility industry, a lot of them are very concerned that Look, they worked a deal, the investor-owned utilities, of which dominate 75% of power generation in this country, worked a deal in the 1920s that they agreed to be regulated with a regulated rate of return in exchange for a monopoly. Now they're saying you're reneging on your deal because you're allowing us to have competition from every homeowner. So some utilities 
uh, are pushing back quite strongly. Uh, unfortunately, the states that uh, are the most hostile to uh, local power on roofs are states like Nevada and Arizona and Florida, some of the most sunniest, some of the sunniest states in the country. Nevertheless, I'm sure we'll work through the politics somehow. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I seem to think that the, <clears throat> the real solar revolution started in the 1970s and was thought then it would be collectors and power towers, mirrors, heating water mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> to turn a traditional turbine. And then along came the solar <clears throat> uh, photovoltaic cells and that was far superior. So that now in Morocco and parts, um, I think in the Middle East, uh, certainly I know in 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 um, Israel, they're still using some of that other technology for purposes of their own because they want to uh, store heat in, in, in molten salt. But uh, nobody in this country thinks we've got one plant that really works well. Solana in Arizona, mm -hmm. there was a power tower built at Sandia and there was one built in Barstow. Um, but Solana, which is on the Arizona public service system, I think does work quite well, but it is now realized not to be the, the ideal technology because of cost. Because basically you're building two systems, you're building a power plant and you're building a collection system. You negate one of those when you go to a photovoltaic. So I think the future will be that we may hook up through uh, uh, sensors and through broadband, hook up all of these rooftop solars so they become a virtual power plant of great use to the utility. Well, let me, Not let a me... competitor, but an adjunct. I agree totally. In fact, uh, I gave a paper. Oh, I better talk to Johnny. I like people who disagree with me. I'm, <laughs> frightened. I'm frightened, frightened when people adopt my views. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just looking at the price of all go down as you talk, which is very disturbing <laughs> to me. Very disturbing as a Texan. <laughs> Ken, Ken, you've got to excuse Dr. Johnson. He's retired now and he has a lot of time to dream. <laughs> Dr. Johnny, so I, I see the future evolving into a, a, a grid, a, a microgrids meshed together. Absolutely. I see the same thing. In fact, I wrote a piece which will be in op-ed pages over the weekend to that effect. Um, I call it, uh, and Johnny, you heard it here the first time, Johnny, Uberization of rooftops. So there you heard you my paper five years ago, right? And you, you remembered it for your article. Oh, no, it came back to me in a <laughs> dream. But thank you so much for writing that paper. So, and so <laughs> Ken, I'm, I'm curious, what is your take on, you know, this time around, it seems like the federal funding for the grid, 60 billion, seven and a half billion for electrification, bunch of other money all over the place, broadband money, probably let's say 80 to 100 billion total for energy stuff uh, in many ways. Do, do you think that this is a, 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 a really a turning moment where things are really gonna happen compared to the ARRA funding of Obama days? And, and what, what's your take on all that funding? Well, the, the Obama money in 2009 was specifically geared to have uh, shovel-ready projects. And utilities were told, whatever you do, do something that's going to get people back to work right away. Mm -hmm. So what did utilities do? They said, oh, we'll put in smart meters and we'll hire installers to unscrew the mechanical meter and screw in the digital meter. That wasn't exactly rocket science. And that didn't do much for the grid, frankly, except mm -hmm. to displace meter readers. That's right. Because in the long run, the utilities could have done more with smart meters, but they're very protective. Meters are the cash register. So I had many clients come to me and said, I want to use the meter for demand response, for energy management and other projects. And the utilities said, stay away from my meter. I even was contacted by the California Public Utilities Commission asking couldn't we use the meters to give customers more information about their usage to give them some incentives? Mm -hmm. And the utilities in California said, no, 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 no. We don't trust our customers. The meter is ours. Keep them away from the meter. Right, right. So, so this time around, do you see, do you see 
a real transformation. It's a lot of money coming. I do. I do because for one thing, you may have heard in the news a couple of days ago, state of California said no more gasoline engine cars after 2035. Yep. The only way that's going to be possible is to have a nationwide network of electric vehicle charging stations, and that's part of this bill. Right, right. You know, the history of in industries tells us that uh, when we were cleaning that manure in New York City and in Dallas, Texas, we were so happy to get rid of the horse because it was just really, really, really polluting everything. Well, we replaced it with something else, I guess, that was also polluting. So therefore, we replaced the horse with the with the car, and we, now we've got a, a a whole nother kind of kind of kind of issue. But but what I want to ask real fast: of all these new business models that's happening, with all of the changes, for example, if, if the meter people are being replaced, what does it mean for the business models in the context of what you do, where people work, how they get paid, what's the new business models, the kind of companies that they can start? Well, I think there's going to be many more business opportunities in the area of local power generation and local energy management. Uh, some of the uh, innovative work we're doing in the standards arena is to define something we call the energy management agent. The EMA is local intelligence on premises that helps you manage your local power generation and helps you decide when shall I depend on my own sources? When do I have to go out to the grid? Uh, or when do I have to go to my neighbors and do a transaction for energy? This is called transactive energy and a very new concept that the Department of Energy has asked the Gridwise Architecture Council to explore. Now, this is overwhelming for consumers. There have been a number of products that have tried to teach consumers about kilowatts and kilowatt hours and demand charges. I am not a fan of those. Consumers have enough to do in their day than to stare at graphs and numbers. We need automation to do this. And this is where I said at the opening of this session, we need the consumer electronics industry to see the business opportunities in providing these energy tools to provide automatic energy management for consumers. Because fundamentally, when we turn to distributed energy resources like wind and solar, we're depending upon sources whose energy can fluctuate. Now, storage batteries are going to smooth that out, but right now it's still relatively expensive. So we need to adapt our usage to the available supply. And that doesn't mean sacrifice and cook at 3 a.m. instead of 6 p.m. What it means is having appliances that uh, number one, are built so they're energy conservant, and number two, the heavy energy usage is shifted where possible, but most importantly, the consumer is in charge. The consumer ranks order what's important to them, and the automation takes over and delivers to them what they want. So if the consumer is having a dinner party at seven, well, the dishwasher is not gonna turn off at four. The dishwasher will know that this is a priority for the consumer and we'll pay a little more for electricity to have the dishes ready. But yes. that doesn't mean the clothes have to be washed at four. That can be done at 10 when the rates are lower. Absolutely. I'd like so, to just so mention, real, sorry, so real quick, let me chime in on something that you said, Ken, and I want to get your take on this. So clearly the funding is going to, is for real. The biggest funding and, and probably the biggest genie out of the bottle is electrification of transportation. Uh, and, and obviously we seem to be serious about it, but, but, here, but here is the engineer in me that, that brings the following. Uh, I, I think that nobody's paying attention. I'm curious if you are in conversations where people are paying attention to the following. Let's take Texas. Texas has 22 million registered vehicles. Let's assume that they were all electric tomorrow morning with a hundred kilowatt hour battery each. That would be that uh, that would mean that Texas uh, would need to have the capacity if the vehicles were to charge at the same time, and they won't. We'll we'll manage that and so on and so on. But but that would mean that we would need twenty two hundred gigawatt hours of capacity on a grid in Texas that is only has 80 
gigawatts, 2200 versus 80. And if you do the math in the United States, it's 280 million registered vehicles, all electric at 100 kilowatt hours, is 28,000 gigawatt hours of capacity, okay? Versus a country that has a total capacity today of 1,100, 28,000 versus 1,100. Are we looking at this electrification and transformation the wrong way? I mean, where is all this generation gonna come from? How, how is this gonna happen? You know, that's, a, your broad view is, something i've been thinking about you and i met at a trade show in february and in fact we touched on this briefly mm -hmm. um what i've been learning is a lot of people with electric vehicles don't treat it like a gas engine where they fill up every time mm -hmm. it's more like a trickle charge mm -hmm. where they just add a few miles by if you if you plug it into an ordinary outlet you get a couple of miles in an hour if you plug it into a what's called a level two charge, you get maybe uh, a dozen miles in an hour up to 20 mm -hmm. miles. It's only when you go to the high speed level three that you add significantly. Most people will do it at level two. And the, the thinking is most people will do it by not standing there waiting for it to happen, but by doing other things. So in fact, uh, what I'm seeing now is the few people I know with EVs don't even pay for electricity because they go to public places where they give away electricity. Right. And it appears that that's going to be an incentive to get people back to stores and shopping malls. So you're so you and I and I agree 300 percent with what you're saying. But here is the problem. You are a Ph.D. in double E. Double E's are the smartest people on the planet. And the grid is designed, as you know very well, to manage peak, not to manage averages. Mm -hmm. So, so how do we how do we solve this conundrum? I mean, how are the engineers going to know the behavior of the charging and the location of the charging to make sure that the grid will actually deliver sixty hertz all the time when it's needed? Well, there are innovative approaches. The one that started in business called A Better Place, I found intriguing. It, yeah. uh, it, it was an invention out of Israel that was deployed, I believe, in Scandinavia using yeah. Renault Sh cars. Sh Sh Shai Agassi was the, was the founder. I remember that. And that the model there was uh, not to fill up the battery, but just swap the battery every time you needed more uh, power in your car. That's right. That way, the manager of the batteries could fill it up from their local solar panel they could do it whatever time made sense for them mm -hmm. uh unfortunately the car makers refused to agree on standardized battery formats right uh, but i heard uh, recently that that concept is being resurrected mm. I, can i can i just yeah. stop, say something here um i'd like to go back i i this is all so fascinating uh but i'd like to go back to what ken was saying earlier and I direct him to uh, demand side management for for retail. For uh, and there's a uh, Texas, there's a uh, <clears throat> rural electric cooperative just outside of Dallas, Rayburn, and the president um, <clears throat> David Naylor told me that they have um, <clears throat> they they are working on saving up to ten percent of generation, uh, an effective ten percent gain with demand side. Uh, direct uh, <clears throat> energy management uh, and they're working with their consumers because they're 90 percent residential and they still can get huge agreement uh, collaboration to put in uh, controls on people's usage uh, and that seems to me very exciting uh, similarly and somewhat more sophisticated in a more sophisticated way there's a beginning in Connecticut called the Green Bank, in which when you join the Green Bank, you have a solar house that has a battery, you agree to provide to the utility on certain days at certain times, a certain amount of electricity. And that seems to me a very interesting and dramatic advance and some sort of a harbinger of the future. Uh, I also, on the generation side, we will need to double our electric generation at least 
without allowance for taking fossil fuel out of the mix uh, by 2050, if we're going to uh, follow the, the plans that at least the Biden administration has. And there's an NA, <coughs> NAS study, I think, which says we'll need to increase it 170%. So there's going to have to be a lot of new generation. We won't have a lot of new transmission, so we're going to have to make the transmission we have more efficient and to produce some of this electricity closer to the point of use. Exactly. There's a big <laughs> emphasis on the distribution grid. That's the city poles. Yeah. Um, well, well, I, well. One thing you said that I want to pick up on, I, I sort of bridle at the idea that someone's even cajoling con customers to allow the customer to be controlled. I think the customer should be in control, but have automation that's responsive to the limitations and needs of the utility. And we will get consumers to We're cooperate, but we don't that. need to force them. No, to I don't think there's any forcing here. This is very much a partnership with the, mm -hmm. with the consumer. Um, in some parts of the world, for some reasons, there is consumer engineering, which is forced, for example, traffic free zones are forcing something on the consumer. Um, this is very collaborative. And it's probably the first time that there really has been an open collaboration between the electric consumer and the electric provider. And you were so right when you went back to the early days of electricity and particularly to the utility company holding, holding act of 1935, where the monopolies were truly um, renewed and revitalized as monopolies uh, and which uh, really have to be looked at probably. Uh, I think we're seeing some erosion, we're seeing more merchant generators and indeed the homeowner may become a merchant generator. I, I would point out that in the United States, although we all hear about the name brand utilities like Pacific Gas and Electric and Texas Utilities and others, we have those are 100 companies. We have three. Uh, we have 3,000 other companies, 2,000 municipally owned utilities, and 1,000 co-ops. That's correct. They are doing some innovative work. And I think so. I work with them quite at. closely, uh, particularly the co-ops, where I found them surprisingly creative. Um, for example, the you know why co the co-ops are owned by their neighbors, and you don't screw your neighbor. Uh, the co-ops are, are, are also remarkably free from any external interference. Mm -hmm. They answer to no one. They have a lot of political support, and they really are amazingly civic-minded. When I started covering the electric industry back in about 1970, you had a residual sense of the social contract, the compact between the big companies and their consumers. Then we went through a period of of mergers, acquisitions, of professional managers coming in, not utility men, but money men or women. And uh, that changed the attitude in the utility industry. And it broke that old sense of obligation. The, and the co-ops still have that sense of obligation. And I think that's really quite remarkable. I, I think we should explain for people that are listening that co-ops were formed by the Roosevelt administration right. to electrify the farmlands in the country. Yep. And 49 of the 50 <laughs> states have rural cooperatives. Yep. The only state that was fully electrified in the 30s was Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The other states all took advantage of this program and set up rural cooperatives of which there are now uh, 900,000. So yeah, I think it's yeah. 900. So so what about what about the opposite side of this uh, of this journey? Why not why not build a huge solar plant? So so take for example the math. So you can uh, do a solar plant that generates 1 megawatt on two and a half acres. So let's replace all the generation 1100 gigawatts of capacity put it all in 688 square miles, half of the size of Delaware. And, and whose backyard? And build transmission lines and power everybody. 
In whose backyard, Andres? Yours? I don't know. <laughs> you, you've got the backyard problem. You've got the transmission right. problem. You've got every problem you don't need. And if you were to extend your argument, Andres, you would say, who needs all these cars? Why do we just have huge buses? It doesn't work. <laughs> Actually, actually, Ron Leonard, who's one of our reviewers, has, has an interesting case on the importance of uh, v VPPs, the virtual power plants. Yep. His argument was that we waste so much, but but uh, there were 1.3 million solar residents in California, and you had the you had the Tesla cars in California, and they actually saved the grid. So Tesla has enough of them with batteries to equal a 500 megawatts power plant well that brings up the interesting the issue about them to deliver power to the grid a week ago and it saved the grid so can we like draw the car batteries into the grid yeah, rather than like just the have them as users that, that ron is talking about <clears throat> ron Lennon is talking about might be part of the equation also so as virtual power plants fly around the world you're also looking at a fly around your neighborhood you're also looking at the possibility of saving uh, andres you don't have to build it maybe they already drive it like your uh, I might mention it, your Ford F-50 electric. <laughs> but, but Absolutely. That, I'm waiting that, for the delivery. That, and I, 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 I tell I, everybody who hasn't heard it, when I get that F-150 Lightning, I'm going <laughs> to charge it at work for free, drive it at home, and run my house and never pay electricity at home again. I then don't, I'm, I don't want to upset it to bring it to my house. house. Andres, when you get that F-150, which you have waited for so long, it will be obsolete. <laughs> um, the I wrote a piece which you will all get, because I make sure you all get it. Uh, I wrote it yesterday, so I'm ahead of the conversation here, talking about a virtual power plant by hooking up very large numbers of rooftop solars in, in solar pl um, panels in a kind of uber virtual power plant sure. and you can bring into that your obsolete ford f-150 lightning is it sheet lightning or is it just a little hint or is it a, a, a real serious lightning but let uh, me but let me let, let me ask ken real quick ken what would happen to the utility if if you know it's F one fifty is the best selling car in America, a million units a year. What would happen if all those F one fifties were, you know, lightning model, and and we would change the behavior? And what would what would the utility need to do if the load changed all of a sudden, and they were running their houses with on the F one fifty and charging at work? What 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 kind of disruption does that give to the grid guy? There will be a disruption, but it's not going to be all at once. First of all, Ford can't produce enough. I've actually been to the Rouge, the Rouge River plant where the Ford F-150 is produced, and okay. it's that place is running all, all day, all night. Mm -hmm. And you can't really speed up the production line. But, so, they're, so they're coming. They're coming. Yeah. yeah. They, because, because Llewellyn keeps telling me that he doesn't believe they're coming. They're coming, Llewellyn. I, I don't believe that people like Toyota are asleep at the switch and not develop a, an equally competitive plant, given the fabulous reception that the mythical F-150 Lightning has had here to fall. So in other words, you're telling me when I go to a tailgate and my alma mater at LSU, I can drive my F-150 down there, plug up all of my tailgate stuff, then just drive it back home and hook my house up to it. That's right. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing, when you're talking, Andres, about the huge solar field, yep. that we ought to look at the real estate we have right around us. We have not only the roofs of buildings, but yeah. we have the skins of buildings. Yeah. If we made our skins photosensitive, even if they weren't that efficient, yep. then think of that as uh, uh, trickle sources. I agree. Oh, I could I just oh. drop into that? How about railroad rights of way? They own an enormous amount of right of way land all over the country. If you just put solar panels on that, you would have quite a large power plant. Do you remember what the, the right of ways kicked off? They kicked off the telecommunications revolution in this country when right. Southern Pacific leased their right of way to a 
a, a fiber optics company which got rebranded as Sprint. You know Sprint. Oh yeah. And they kicked off the competitive long distance phone industry. We grew up with the idea that the further away you called, the more expensive it was. That's yeah. Right. That was baloney, as yeah. proved by the wiring of the country now and flat. Let me let home. me ask you. We, we we're running. As I'm looking at the clock here. We're going to go over a couple of minutes because this is too interesting. But Ken, a, a lot of people don't see what you see, and I'm curious if there is any tea leaves towards the Jetsons creation by what you see. So there is something that you know very well in the audience, order FERC order 2222, which is the aggregation of energy storage on the grid and operators are gonna show up out of nowhere. We know that Tesla applied to become a retail energy provider in Texas and they are working on a new offering is coming. Everybody's freaking out what's gonna happen. Do you, are, are, are Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook and Tesla sitting in the standards committees and are they proposing new things, new technologies, new gadgets, new widgets? What's going on in there? The standards committee I chair does not have traditional utilities. It has engineering companies, some large. It has consumer electronics companies whose brand names you would easily recognize from Asia. Mm -hmm. So uh, the real issue I have is with our traditional power industry. Where are they? Why don't they wake up instead of wasting their money lobbying to try to keep us on oil and keep us on central power generation? Come on, guys. Do we have to wait until a whole generation retires and new people with uh, understanding uh, digital technology come in and run utilities? Well, it is, it is, it is a regulated industry. And it moves, as we have said, with the uh, with the movement like a glacier. Yep. And the technology that they are sitting on the shelf to make the to make the industry exactly like we did the computers. So right now, that industry, our industry, is where computers were sixty years ago, and now Microsoft know where every bit of their technology is. What's happening on the screen and everything. So it's pretty interesting that this this thing that is so important to us. We do not we do not know where it is, right? Uh, they're still using levers. It has not been digitized, and I think the problem is, I mean, it has been funded. It's sitting on the shelf. But my question is this: as we always ask, if you're making the billions of dollars on a 1920 technology, why should you change? That's the very good point. But keep in mind that if your lights go out, the utility probably has no idea until you and your neighbors call and they look at a plot and say, oops, we probably have a problem in that neighborhood. Let me so, say, we had, we had a snow out in Austin, so I understand exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> let me, Lou let Allen, me, I don't need any comments from you. Let me, let, me share, <laughs> let, me, let me share real quick that next week is the... Digital 360 Summit. Llewellyn King is delivering a keynote on the State of the Union. Uh, John Butler is delivering a keynote on new business models. Uh, Llewellyn King is moderating their Smart Cities panel, which is being keynoted by the mayor of Austin. And he has the mayor of Brownsville in his panel. Uh, and John Butler is in the uh, digital infrastructure ecosystem panel, which is going to discuss how the bankers, the insurance agencies, and everybody is getting into the predictive asset management financing world using technologies like blockchain. You do not want to miss this conference. Uh, if you want to sign up and you haven't figured out how, shoot me an email, andres at 512cmg.com. I want to say thank you to our um, uh, speakers and keynotes. Uh, I have two logos to add to this uh, slide, which is Cisco Systems and Arm. Uh, is quite the, the pedigree of companies talking about all kinds of things, including NASA, National Grid, City of Austin, US uh, Patent and Trademark Office, and many more, the US Chambers of Commerce. Uh, and remind you that CEDAR and the work we do there on research and development, 700 acres, nine labs, focus on utilities, buildings, energy, waterways, water cities, mobility, network sensors, and data. And I want to thank Texas State for sponsoring the roundtable. Ken, last question from me. 
uh, what, what's in front of you the next six months? What are you working on that is really important that we should know about the next six months? Uh, we're continuing to work on autonomous energy management to empower consumers. We're working on uh, keeping the environment uh, cyber secure, working on cyber security standards to sort of put a cocoon around the house. So we monitor what traffic goes in and out and make sure it's going to the right servers in the, the big bad world and coming from the right servers. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, our mantra is put the consumer in charge. Got it, got it. Fi final thoughts, gentlemen? I think it's a great, great tradition that you're doing. I think that the home has always been important, but I also think as we said, there's an interaction between all of this with the, with the power plants, the grid edge and what can be done in the home. And I think there are tons of business models that's taking place with just knowing what happens in the home, underwriting of insurance, understanding where electricity will come and go in the home. But more importantly, we have a situation now, if we do it right, where we'll know everything about what people need in America based on the digitization, digitization of what we're doing. I think that this is fascinating. I think we're right at the beginning of a huge revolution. Um, and that science is at hand to solve all our problems if we could only deal with our politics. And I want to say how wonderful it is having Ken on this program, a stimulating, interesting man, and really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for being with us today. Very Thank welcome, you. Andres, a pleasure. Absolutely. And let the record show that Llewellyn finally learned how to tie a regular tie. I have never seen him on with a bow tie. Not the <laughs> any other. Un Not un unlike bow. yourself, Johnny, tied up in your theories of business models, I have flexibility. <laughs> I, 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 I see, I see that the, the Llewellyn is just showing that he's a versatile man. Well, well Johnny, it, take us away. Take I us talked away, about Johnny. Bow tie so, I talked about the bow tie so, so much, I had an effect. I'm going to do the well as a favorite song. <laughs> it's always now. <laughs> Nothing ever goes away. Everything is here to say. And it's always now. So brace your heart. Find yourself some sanity. It's really only you and me. Now. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you very that's much. Good night. If not, that's talent.